The shipping industry has a problem that it doesn't like to talk about. A dark secret. Safety standards, by and large, have been steadily improving over recent decades. Ship casualties and incidents have reached an all-time low in spite of a global pandemic, and a steady tightening of regulatory standards have raised the bar across the board. But, and this is a big but, there is a significant and growing fleet of ships to which none of this applies. An unprecedented deluge of sanctions has divided the industry between those operating within the established rules-based order of safety conventions, class, insurance and international oversight, versus a worryingly large section of the fleet that has disappeared off the radar. The serious and significant safety threat that the Dark Fleet poses has been well documented, not least by Lois List, but the ships themselves are only part of the problem. There is a whole infrastructure out there that is supporting this return to opacity at the bottom of the industry. And this is not yet another story about sanctions I'm about to tell you. It's bigger than that. Fraudulently flagged ships are hopping effortlessly between registries that are unable or unwilling to tackle their lawless flouting of the established rules-based order. These are vessels that in some cases make the Dark Fleet look like law-abiding citizens by comparison, often with no flag, no insurance, and an impenetrable nexus of state-sponsored opacity readily supporting their illicit movements behind the scenes. These ships do not operate in isolation. They only exist and are able to trade because they are able to operate with a combination of direct support and tacit complicity from companies, institutions and governments that are willing to turn a blind eye. The support networks are complex, they are opaque, but at the top of it all there are governments that are failing to provide meaningful oversight of ships flying their flag. And that's where I want to focus today. Because there is a growing concern among largely Western governments that the ships engaging in illegal operations or dangerous sanctions circumvention tactics are increasingly being flagged by a handful of states with little to no oversight of the ships in their registries. And let's be specific here. We are talking about flags like Gabon, which has become the world's fastest growing ship register thanks largely to an influx of dark fleet tankers plying sanctioned Russian oil trades. We are talking about startup flags like the landlocked African state of Eswatini, which, despite having no maritime administration, no links to the International Maritime Organization, and no commitment to the basic canon of international maritime law, recently established itself as home to sanctioned ships before kicking them out again and leaving those ships to trade between Russia and occupied Crimea and Syria, with apparently no flag or oversight. So, how do we deal with this? It's a question that I posed this week to Steen Lund, uh, the chief executive of Rightship, who is well-versed in the metrics that make ships safe and, in their absence, dangerous. And I put it to him that the shipping industry is effectively operating now on a two-tier basis, one where rules are adhered to and one where circumvention, unfortunately, is an all-too-common occurrence. How do we deal with what appears to be a growing gulf between normal shipping and a growing underbelly of shipping that is apparently able to circumvent the standard rules-based order that we've established over the last few decades. And, and, and that is the $64,000 question, isn't it? Um, clearly, it is not regulation uh, that sets us up for continued success. Um, there is a significant amount of regulation, but there is... Uh, Certainly also lots of uh, voluntarism that dictates what risks are acceptable uh, to the users of the vessels, what risks are acceptable to uh, the ports that accept them into their infrastructure, uh, what risks are acceptable to uh, the companies that, that service them and, and whether they are then uh, an, an IG uh, club or, or whether it's a class society or it's a flag. There is a a level of due diligence that is not being done uh, that allows these vessels that, that are clearly substandard and, and are uh, physically in their operation behaving uh, with evidence of that substandard, uh, that essentially the income that's derived from doing business uh, across those vessels and, and with the owners and managers is by some parties being prioritized over uh, the risk that should or or should rather not be accepted. So I think we are, we are back to 
possibly uh, the same level of definition uh, that we see from really well-run uh, cargo owning and, and hence chartering companies, where, of course, there is a, a physical possibility uh, to charter a vessel at potentially a, a lower uh, charter rate, uh, but that that vessel would, would come with uh, a different risk profile than uh, the, the vessel at charter defines uh, itself to, to uh, accept. Uh, and, and this is the world that, that we in right ship see every day where uh, we are presented 40,000 times a year uh, with the, the task by a charterer uh, to look through the risk profile of a vessel. And in doing so, we look at things like class. We look at uh, the insurance underwriter. Uh, we look at the flag and, and we have specific measurements that we then communicate uh, to that charterer where either we, we recommend uh, against or, or for uh, chartering that vessel. Now it's entirely up to the charterer after our recommendation, what it does with, with the data we pass on. Um, but if the vessel is presented, then at least there is a possibility to use that data transparently um, to make the, the chartering decisions. And more importantly, there is a, a board-sanctioned process that runs across the better charterers uh, that, that validates the uh, risk accept, acceptance, excuse me, um, that, that would, for instance, uh, do away with uh, the uh, engagement of a vessel uh, that flies a flag that would sit on uh, a blacklist or that would uh, engage insurance underwriting uh, that, that is not up to the standard defined by that charterer uh, or, for that matter, typically uh, that is, is not classed by uh, an IX classification society. But this is voluntary again, uh, and, and it matches good, good business practice. It begs the question, uh, is this good for my brand? Would I like to be associated with a vessel that, like the, this Arena One, we can now read in the press, uh, has been arrested? Um, and had it had cargo on, it, it doesn't take long. We've seen many examples. Um, AMSA in Australia is, is very... Uh, aggressive, one would say, around this to call out, this is the charterer, here it is by name, that was associated with, with this activity. Um, and you could potentially even argue uh, that the charterer is, uh, has no uh, action or say in whether, for example, a seafarer is being paid as per contract. Uh, but, but he still goes through the due diligence of determining that the ship management company that has this, this vessel uh, in custody follows a, a certain set of rules. I said at the outset that this is not just another podcast on the Dark Fleet, which, I will remind listeners now, accounts for just over 12% of the tanker fleet, according to Lloyd's List Intelligence. But the fact that we now have such a large number of ships in the Dark Fleet is a problem. And the problem with the metrics that Steen mentions there, the associations with the right p &I clubs, the right classification societies, the right flags... That no longer really applies to a good proportion of the fleet because they are operating outside of the standards that we consider to be the norm of good shipping. On a political level, that's clearly a difficult and sensitive topic. But safety-wise, it's a really big and black-and-white concern. The International Chamber of Shipping's Secretary General, Guy Platten, suggests that we may not know the full extent of the problem until it's too late. I mean... <laughs> I think it, 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 it's it, we obviously affirm our clear and unwavering support for safe quality shipping operating in accordance with the ship owner's obligations which includes adequate insurance levels adequate maintenance all these different things I mean I think we're not going to know how this is going to pan out until sadly there's an accident or a pollution incident and we'll see whether the insurance cover and all these things are adequate at that point and you know uh, we're as concerned as, as, as anybody on that one but you know ship owners need to uh, undertake you know discharge their obligations in a, in a proper way so um you know we, we do have obviously we engage with governments on sanctions and the like and it's as you say it's it's too it's outside our politics outside our thing but you know we would encourage that to to look at the unintended consequences of sanctions as well because that's what you're i think sort of alluding to here really because ultimately it'll be the environment of the seafarers will suffer if things aren't done properly Apologies for the background noise there. Guy was talking to me from an airport in this recording. 
But the point here is that this is not specifically a sanctions issue. It's a question of flag state responsibility. We've seen a rising number of operations that are being used to house the Dark Fleet. And we've talked about examples like Gabon, which is normally controlled by a government that's just gone through a military coup, but realistically is operated from a UAE-based private corporation with minimal oversight from a government that purports to represent these ships. How do we deal with that disconnect between a sovereign state who has every right to operate a ship registry and a private company that seems to offer refuge to ships of questionable safety standards and oversight? Well, we can certainly look at the data, and one reference point in this is the International Chamber of Shipping's annual flag state report. Uh, I, you know, the importance of our flag, flag state performance table can't be overstated because it does shine a light on these sort of activities because it's very clear on a number of different factors which flags are underperforming. And it also, you know, allows port state control to look at it and to, to target ships as well. So... You know, but it's by shining a light on, on the practices is probably the best way, and, and, and you're doing exactly that now. So, you know, we, I, there's no way we'd condone any sort of substandard ship um, at all. So, and you, you're right, Gabon, I mean, that great maritime nation, you know, it's the fastest growing flag. So, I mean, it's, uh, it, it does call into question. But by, by I think, being transparent as a, as a responsible industry body, as, as we are, and uh, calling it out, and uh, having things like the flag state performance table, which does, uh, you know, really holds the flag states to account and at least shows them for what they are. I think that all these things sort of help. And, and we do raise these issues at IMO and in other places as well. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the problem is um, the, the people who, who operate in the, in the shadows are not the ones who are going to be members of associations uh, generally. Steen Lund offers a similar perspective from right ships analysis. In, in this context, I, my role is essentially to provide, uh, together with, with all the good colleagues in Rightship, uh, data that provides transparency about these issues. And, and there, I think, uh, among others, uh, the port state control data that, that shows port state deficiencies and then that shows uh, detentions, um, the, the incident data, uh, the abandonment data uh, speaks volumes and speaks with clarity. Uh, so uh, it is absolutely uh, indisputable uh, that we see uh, more of, of the negative side of, of those metrics um, on, on vessels that gravitate towards, uh, for instance, uh, the type of flags that you are inquiring here. So, so yes, uh, the metrics are, are very clear there. Those abandonment figures that Steve mentions there, by the way, they continue to rise. They were up 10% again last year. Nearly 1,700 seafarers abandoned in 132 separate cases, all reported to the International Labour Organization last year. And the flags involved in these cases are, by and large, the same flags involved in dark fleet flagging. They are the same flags found on port state control black and grey lists. Safety standards at the top of the industry have largely improved. But the worst bits of shipping, they're getting worse. Unfortunately, again, the data evidence would, would suggest that that's absolutely the case. Uh, we thought when we initially in the early days of COVID saw a, a, a rise in abandonment of seafarers, that it was related to uh, the, the difficulty essentially of, of operating. But that proved to be wrong uh, because... Um, in, in consecutive years, right up until till now, we've seen the um, number of vessels and the number of seafarers that are, are being abandoned on vessels year on year continuously increase. And, and if one looks at the flags that are associated with the abandonment of seafarers, then, then you have the answer. Um, there are only three uh, sort of significant flags in terms of, of size on, on that I'm trying to not say top 10 list because it, it really is a, a bottom 10 list. Um, and, and therein lies part of the answer. Uh, Panama, as, as, and this is, of course, transparent data, Panama tops the list. But, but Panama is also a very significant flag in terms of number of vessels. So in, in, in that sense, the correlation is, is not entirely off. But you do have uh, flags like um, the, the Comoros flag or the Palau flag or Togo flag or Cameroon flag or, or, or the Iranian flag are on that list of, uh, of, of the 10 most recalcitrant uh, flags. 
so, so that's that's certainly a very validation that um, things are not across the board uh, as they should be, and, and that potentially masks the the overall improvement in safety statistics. If if you look at PSC uh, statistics, perhaps I, I could add that it's it's also interesting to look at, uh, for instance, the uh, Paris MOUs uh, listing regime where, where, of course, the Paris MOU, among others, operates a, a blacklist. And, and, and sort of going full circle on, on that conversation about uh, the community supporting these efforts, it is interesting to see that that the um, more than half of the uh, IX class societies uh, certainly uh, quite significantly uh, support uh, the some of the larger uh, vessels, uh, excuse me, some of the larger flags uh, that are on the Paris MOU blacklist uh, with uh, IX class uh, societies uh, having vessels in, in the hundreds per class society there. And, and that in itself is not a, is not a metric. So I'm, I'm in no way trying to call out the class societies, but it begs the question, if you have, let's say, 100 vessels in, in your class society, is every single one of them um, a bona fide potential for you to work with and help improve. There is a consulting role, uh, whether whether you're a class society or, or, or others, that is important to play. Uh, and, and I'm not in any way arguing that uh, that these uh, ship owners across the board uh, should just be abandoned and, and not serviced. But I do raise the question: uh, Is there a adequate boardroom discussion taking place? with insurers, with class, with flag that um, sets aside commercial opportunities and gains and looks at the role of safety and risk management. And is that done at a sufficient depth uh, for, for those uh, vessel owners that, that one may not uh, be able to, to turn around and, and see uh, perform positively uh, could could essentially find themselves uh, in a very difficult situation to trade. As I say, this is not just a dark fleet problem. There are concerns regarding the dark fleet, certainly, but it's only part of the problem for the IMO member states that are seeking to enforce a genuine link between a ship and the flag that it flies. The fraudulent flagging and registration of vessels has become a growing concern for governments that are worried that the exploitation of regulatory loopholes in shipping is potentially undermining the integrity of global trade and risking safety and ecological disaster through the lack of safety standards enforcement that it implies. At present, there are 108 ships known to be operating under fraudulently registered flags. That's according to the IMO's own database. However, the officials inside the IMO and everybody else can see that the real number is likely to be much higher. A study commissioned by the World Maritime University and the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, is due to be considered by the IMO's legal committee in April. The report reveals the extent of the problem and it raises some pretty serious questions regarding illegal activities and substandard shipping operations and the risk to seafarers' lives and marine pollution. It also states that there is a widespread concern amongst member states that the fraudulent flag issue threatens a subversion of the global regulatory system of the IMO if it is not properly addressed. But it is difficult. The study reveals how the pattern of ships flying a false flag, or even multiple false flags, is managing to move between jurisdictions and escaping scrutiny precisely because of the glacial pace of information that's being passed between governments on a normal basis. I mentioned earlier the nascent flag of Eswatini, this, I should stress, is an operation that has been given the green light by the government. And as a sovereign state, they have every right to do so, regardless of the shortcomings they may have in the field of maritime. But the point here is that three of the ships that they initially took in, before subsequently expelling them, were sanctioned entities. Now, those ships have continued to fly the flag of Eswatini, despite not being registered. I know that because we have seen photographs of them passing through the Bosphorus this week. But these are ships now that have been expunged from Eswatini. They have no flag. Apparently, they have no insurance either, and they are regularly trading from Russia into Syria. And this is not an anomaly. 
If you read the Fraudulent Flags report, and I would urge everybody listening to do so, it says, and I quote here, by the time the period of provisional registration lapses, the perpetrator can file a new application for registration to another registry. However, during that period, a ship would appear to be validly registered, albeit provisionally, with a lawful registry. That is what is happening here, and it happens time and time again. This is a pattern of deception. The process of international maritime regulation is essentially a cat-and-mouse game of implementation and evasion, and we are failing to keep up with it right now. And I, th I think that's the, the essence of our conversation today, Richard, that if you go back in history and, and look at some of those markers that were of, of significance, and, and, and allow me again to just go through a couple of them, um, we obviously had the, the Titanic colliding with, with an iceberg in, in, in 1912, and, and that triggered then uh, two years, hence the adoptions of, of the uh, Solus Convention, uh, to address the lack of adequate life-saving appliances and, and regulations on board the ship. Um, but again, it was triggered by this monumental uh, event. And, and the same is the case with a number of, of other conventions or, or regulations. You can trace back uh, the, the Colrex uh, Convention in, in the 1960s that, that was adopted um, to, to address uh, prevention of, of collision at sea following uh, a significant number of, of collisions, uh, maybe a little more telling, uh, the Marpole Convention uh, that was adopted in, in 1973 uh, followed the uh, oil spill from the Torrey Canyon in, in 1967 off the, the coast of Cornwall. And, and what I appeal to here in our conversation is we should not wait for uh, the challenge that we are discussing today of the use of what clearly are uh, substandard flags to trigger another very substantial uh, maritime event, whether that is then one that would cause loss of life, um, loss of infrastructure or, or loss of cargo and, and, and vessel. Um, we know better. We have the history that, that shows us that regulations are required at times. Uh, and, and here certainly the starting point should be a voluntary assessment of whether uh, that commercial engagement that uh, a support of a flag constitutes is appropriate or it should be stood down. Well, that seems like a decent place to leave it for this week. My thanks to both Guy and Steen for talking to me and thank you for listening to what has become something of a hobby horse for me in recent weeks. I appreciate this is a difficult and sensitive topic, but I think it's important that we call this out. And to that end... I am very open to any new information or examples that listeners would like to point in my direction for further investigation. Richard.mead, that's M-E-A-D-E, -E, at lloydslistintelligence.com is the place to send all your tips, which will be treated in the strictest of confidence and investigated thoroughly. For now, though, have a good week and stay safe out there. Goodbye. Goodbye.